last class we had just gotten done talking about integration by parts. It just started talking about this idea. Why can I not? There it goes. Okay. This idea of present value and actual income value. Present value is the idea of, in terms of dollars today, what your account will have is worth, right? So let's say you make a million dollars over a 20 year period. Your bank account is going to read a million dollars, but in today's currency, how much is that actually worth? That's what present value tells you. Whereas actual income is what it reads in your bank account, right? So that million dollars is actual income. Present value is in today's dollars. What is that actual income worth? So as an example, we've got a million dollars that we went through the lottery. I'm gonna go ahead and charge each of you about 20K, so cough it up, I want my money. Um, so what we're doing here is we're going to solve two different things, the actual value and the present value. I mean, the, the actual amount and the present value. do that, first we want to observe what these different functions are, right? CT integrated over zero to T DT This is equal to actual and then CT E negative RT DT zero to T. I want to write these as T naughts. sums for 20 years, right? So CT is equal to 50K. And to calculate this actual cost, we identify T naught. It's going to be 20. So now, putting all of this together and doing our integration, times t, where t is equal to 0 to 20, right? So this is going to end up being 50,000 times 20, which is equal to a million dollars. Okay, so the annuity does in fact pay out a million dollars, right? All right. So nothing too terribly folky is going on yet. So we're getting paid a million dollars, but the inflation rate is going to devalue those dollars. 
the inflation rate here is 6%, which is equal to 0 0.06. So calculating the present value, that'll tell us what it's going to be worth, right? In today's dollar, what is that million dollar actually worth? So jumping ahead, just so we have the comparison now, we've got zero to 20 times 50,000 times E to the negative 0 0.06 T DT. Now in this particular case, we can solve this integration straightforward, right? We don't need any fancy tricks or anything. Just go ahead, pull out the 50,000 and integrate it just like it's an exponential, right? Nothing too crazy is going on here. So pulling out that 50,000, 0 to 20 of E to the negative 0 0.06 T T going to be equal to 50,000 times e to the negative 0 0.06 t over negative 0 0.06 t from 0 to 20, right? Which is exactly what they've got here as well. My mistake, I did not mean to put that T there. Looking at the exponent, writing, talking at the same time, prone to mistakes. So from here, we're just gonna do these calculations just like we always would, right? We'd apply our bounds and nothing crazy here. But notice, well, this comes out to be is five hundred eighty-two thousand three hundred thirty-eight dollars approximately. That's nowhere near the million dollars. That means with inflation over a twenty-year period, you didn't really win a million dollars. You won five hundred eighty-two thousand dollars. So about fifty percent of that. This is actually why lotteries such a great deal for states because with the way inflation is well they actually end up paying out as far less than what they'd have to air quotes make sense so just as another example and in this example we will have to use uh integration by parts In this example, the company excuse me, expects to make some money, obviously. Why else would they be in business, right? So they expect to have an income for the next five years that can be described using this equation. $100,000 times T. going to be over a five-year period. And the inflation rate is 5%. So putting all this together, at zero to five, a 
of 100,000 times T times E to the negative 0 0.05 T dt. Well, this is that one of those general forms that I've warned you all about, right? We're going to have to apply integration by parts once. So I'm going to let you all work on that for, give you all about two minutes. Uh, and I'm going to jump to the next slide and we're going to look at how this works out. Okay, so let's jump to that next slide. Well, first, just to, to give you all an idea of what's actually happening here. So the expected income is modeled using this first integration, right? This is going to give you what's actually in your bank account. The present value is going to be modeled using this integration, right? What they're saying here is that the area under this exponential curve is what's actually going to be in the bank account. And it's going to tell you how much this money is actually worth. Make sense? So comparing everything, Starting off with our actual integration, we've got 100,000 times T, E to the negative 0 0.05 T, dt, integrated from 0 to 5. After we pull out that 100,000, it's pretty obvious that this is going to be integration by parts, right? So then, setting Thing. All right, so setting dv equal to e to the negative 0 0.05t, integrating this thing, right, we're going to get negative 20 e to the negative 0.05t, which follows from 
the solution up here. So this is just a general form given a setup like what we have. Um, from there, we're going to set u equal to t, then du is going to be dt. So putting all of this together then, u times v is going to come out to be t times negative 20 e to the negative 0 0.05 t. Everything looks good here. Here, well, that's just the same integral we had before, right? We're just plugging in v now, right? Makes sense what I mean? From there, we're just going to do the calculus and the arithmetic just like we normally would. Does this make sense to y'all? Does this jive? The big part of this problem is setting up your u and your dv. Coming back to our present value equation, once we factor out that 100,000, we see that it's in a form kind of like what we had talked about before, that t to the e something x. So we know we're going to have to integrate it by parts at least once. Setting dv and u accordingly, then we can get v and du, then we can use the integration by parts, and then we can apply our bounds, and that's what they're saying here. Do the integration, and then apply your bounds. Notice these two integrals aren't at all different. They're just saying, hey, check it out. We've got t e to the negative 0 0.05 t dt. This integration times 100,000. Well, this integration is this just with those bounds, right? So if we just pass that integration through and then plug those bounds back on, it's the same idea. Make sense? So having said that, that was the end of that section. What we've got now is integration using tables. Integration using tables is actually a pretty straightforward idea. We've already done it a bunch in this class. Integration by tables is really what, um, I don't want to say like this, but I don't know how else to say it. It's what the old heads used to do. Um, before the internet, before Wolfram Alpha, before Symbol Lab, before Mathematica, MATLAB, and really modern computing, the computing that became available and possible in the late 90s and early 2000s, before all of that, we used to have books. And when I say books, I mean fucking books, dudes. Like huge stacks of books that would be nothing but tables of integration. And the way these books would work is you would have an integral that you'd be working on. You'd go through, you'd apply by parts, you'd apply whatever you need to, to get it in its most simple form possible. Usually the first thing you would do is use some form of u substitution. Then if necessary, you would apply by parts. And you'd reduce it down to the smallest possible integral. Then you would pull out your book and you'd say, all right, I have no clue how to solve this particular integral. So let me look it up. We in this class have three pages of examples. There's a bunch. Like I said, there are entire books to these things. But the reason for them is because of integrations like this. 
how to solve this isn't immediately obvious. What's your first thought on this? What do y'all think? Yeah, we want to get that radical out somehow, right? So we can multiply by one. But really, there's not one single nice way of solving this, is there? Like, there is nothing really honest that jumps out other than maybe integration by parts and multiplying by one, like you're saying. So a mathematician would say, well, hell no. Grab their book and look it up. Well, what their book can tell them is that an integral of the form u over the square root of is it a minus a plus b u b u this thing's going to be equal to negative two times two a minus the u over 3d squared times a plus b u plus a constant. This is what the integration table tells you. We're going to come back to this integral. So now, looking at our integral, we've got x square root of x minus 1 dx, which we can rewrite as the integral of x over the square root of negative 1 plus x dx. So now we would try to match our terms. Start off with, we'd say, all right, well, this A, this A is going to be negative one in our problem, right? So A is equal to negative one and B B is going to be 1, and U is, of course, going to be X. So according to our table, then, the answer is going to come out to be negative 2 times the quantity. 2 times negative 1 minus 1 times x divided by 3 times 1 squared times the square root of negative one plus one plus my mistake times x plus a constant. Then we 
can simplify and do their arithmetic to, to get it as simple as we can from here, right? The arithmetic and the algebra. So doing that really quickly, this is going to come out to be C minus two times negative two minus X over three times the square root of negative one plus X. The square is on the one. And this is where some of the danger to all this comes in is making sure we have things like our powers matched up the right way, making sure we remember our signs, and identifying wherever there's a one, because ones are really going to be problematic here. For example, this BU, right? It's not obvious that, oh yeah, I, I gotta mark down B as equal to one. It's easy to skip over things like that. Uh, so squares, really powers, and ones are the big things that we have to keep an eye on. Uh, having said that, here we can obviously keep simplifying, right? And get our final answer to be C plus four plus 2x over 3 times the square root negative 1 plus x. So we went all the way through to simplify. And comparing Comparing our answer to theirs, all they did was pull out the two thirds and write it as a fraction outside, right? They pulled out the two here and the three here. Just said, let this be a coefficient instead of actually pushing it all the way through. But otherwise, it's the same. And what they're telling us is that we have to identify our A and our B our u and our du. But in doing this, and in telling us that we have to identify our u and our du, they're telling us something else. That what this table is written in terms of is u substitution, right? So in general, the last thing we want to do before we apply these tables is trying to apply u sub to our problems because they let us reduce our problems down hugely to just what's important, right? So as another example of just that, let's consider this integral right here. is equal to 2x 
and du is equal to 2x dx. Agreed? So, rewriting this and applying substitution now, first, let's make sure that we organize this in a way that it becomes obvious to us. Here we are going to have x squared that quantity squared minus 9 all to the one half x dx. Okay, then back over here then. x squared up here, well that's u. So this is going to be u squared minus 9 to the one half. And this is just one half of du, right? So with u sub, we have this integral that we can simplify, or rewrite rather, as one half the integration of u squared minus 9 to the one half power du. Can we simplify this any further? Not really. That's pretty much where we're at, right? So now we come to our table. And our table tells us that any integral of the form u squared minus a squared to the one half power du, this is going to be equal to one half u times u squared minus a squared, that quantity to the one half power, minus a squared, the ln of the absolute value of u plus u squared minus a squared, the one half power, absolute value plus c. I forgot to close that square bracket. Oh man, this sucks. That's ugly, right? So now we want to come over here and we want to say, all right, u, we said was equal to x squared. According to this, a squared is equal to 9. Do we need to worry about anything else? The only time a shows up is as a squared, right? So we can just go ahead and not worry about what a is and instead just focus on a squared. Agreed? So now we've got to come back. Say, so, all right, we've got our A, we know our U. We are, in fact, in this form, right? So, what we're going to have is one half times all of this, right? Everybody cool with this? So, in that case, uh, one half times 
one half u here we said is x squared times the quantity x squared minus 9 that all to the one half power it's just this part right here so far minus 9 times the ln of the absolute value of my mistake I meant to write x to the fourth here because it's u squared so it's the square of x squared so that was a typo right there we come back over here u is x squared plus u squared is x to the fourth minus nine that quantity raised to the one half power absolute value closed plus a constant that's pretty much as simple as we're going to get it honestly we're not going to simplify that any further I mean, there's a few methods we might be able to use, but it's not worth the headache or the heartache from this point on. And comparing, that's what they said, right? They said, come back to your formula. And everywhere you see a U and everywhere you see an A, plug in the corresponding values. So all we're doing is we're using u cell to reduce our integral to the most simple form possible, and then identifying what values go with what, right? Oh, and I forgot to close that. Because one half times a constant is still a constant. It doesn't matter what that constant is, we can just write it as C. So yeah, like I said, we could go ahead and simplify the, the one over four. We could go ahead and multiply these two together. But beyond that, there's nothing else we can really do here. Folks at home, does this make sense? About as clear as mud, but that's okay. About as clear as mud, okay. So what's not clear here? What's going on? I'm assuming, where the hell did we find this formula, right? I'm guessing that's probably where the lack of clarity is. So what this formula is, is we're saying, OK, we've got this equation. Using u sub, we simplified it down to this. Let me erase all of this. Okay, this is the most simple form we can get our equation into once we apply u sum. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go back to those tables and we're going to find an equation that looks something like it. So the first thing to notice is this table of integrals is broken down by forms. Forms involving u to the n, well, that's your, that is going to be your power rule and your logarithmic rule, right?
going down one more, we've got our rational functions, which almost looks like something we could have, right? We've got A and we've got a U, but our U is the U squared. So this isn't quite what we want, right? But we can still skim these, maybe. Maybe it will show up. So we go through and we look through and we've got U over a plus B U, U over A plus B U, the quantity squared, to the nth power, nothing's jumping out, right? Okay, no dice on that. Okay, now something that looks more promising. We've got a radical now. Okay, maybe it'll be in here. Well, the first form is u to the nth power times the square root of a plus bu. That's not it. One over, that's not it. None of these seem to be it yet, right? But here's something, u squared plus or minus a squared under the radical. We've got u squared minus well, nine is just three squared, right? But really, we can write any constant as the square of another constant, right? So we do have a, uh, u squared minus something squared inside of a square root. So this looks this looks like it. But hey, notice there is a catch. We are demanding that a is greater than. Or equal or is just greater than zero. Okay, so we go through. We say, hey, we've got this plus or minus form. The square root of u squared plus or minus a squared is integrated with respect to u is equal to this huge long thing. Okay. Well, in our case. We've got minus, which is the sign below. So we're going to keep all the signs below. The sign below, the sign below, the sign below. So minus, minus, minus. And we're going to go back to our problem. And our problem is going to say that is, in fact, the formula we used. It is formula 21. Not to be confused with the game or the uh, the cars. Which use a lot of really good heady math, actually. Like the designing of Formula 21 cars, it's actually really dope. Mathematically, that is. But anyhow, so now you say, all right. Formula 21 is the formula that it looks like we want to use. Agreed? So we've got to identify what our u is. Well, u we said was x squared. Then we have to identify where our a is. Well, a is going to be plus or minus 3, actually. But since all we're doing is using a squared anyhow, we can do the same as just saying what is a squared. a squared is 9. Um, make sense? So having said that, I should note them saying that A is equal to 3 is a result of the fact that this formula was defined on A greater than 0. That's why they're saying A is equal to 3 here. So we go through and we plug in a squared and we plug in u and that's how we get this final form. We say, all right, our integration started off looking like this. Integration started off in this form. When we applied, it, when we applied u sub to it, we got this form. Well, this integral can be solved using formula 21. So we're going to have one half times formula 21. 
Then we're going to go through and say, all right, u is equal to x squared, a is equal to 3. So we have 1 half times formula 21 with all of our values plugged in. And that's what this final one is. Does that help demystify it a little bit? A little bit, yeah, thank you. Oh, thanks. Because it is, at first, this is a really weird process. Like, where, where the hell did I get formula 21 from? Honestly, I couldn't tell you where they got it from. I have no clue. I think it's a, a, a trick substitution trick that they used here. But I don't know right off the top of my head. And that's the whole point of these tables is to say, there are some integrals that are just stupid. Like, this sucks. Why would I want to do this? Let me do, let me grab my table and solve it using my table instead. Because I don't have time for this. Make sense? My, uh, my first year as an undergrad, there weren't very many online uh, resources yet for integration stuff. So I had a professor who, in one of our, uh, was taking modern physics and I had clubbed him to it my first year. Uh, and in our modern physics course, we had to, to calculate a quantum orbital of whatever, whatever, whatever. She had a big book like this. It was like, you're not going to be able to solve this by hand. Here's a book. It gave us one of these big tables. So it, it does still show up. Uh, not nearly as much. There are some integrals that we just can't solve using computers at all without like a numerical method. So if it's an indefinite integral, like what we've been working with, there are some that just can't be solved at all um, by a computer. And for that reason, we have these giant books that we still occasionally use. I actually have like three of them in my office, but they're not that common anymore. Having said that, there are examples in the book, or there are a couple formulas that will tell you you're going to have to do a second integration. And the trick behind this is just like with uh, integration by parts. You say, OK, cool. I'll do this. I'll simplify it as far as I can get it. And then if I need to do it again, I'll do it again. That's really all this is saying. Makes sense? Notice this is an integration by parts problem. And it is, in fact, going to have to be done twice. We actually talked about this last Friday, this exact problem last Friday. So I'm going to jump to the next example. I'm really quickly going to explain this idea. No, I'm not because I don't have enough time to. Okay. No, I don't have enough time. It's 22 anyhow. All right, so I'm going to let y'all go. Um, if y'all have any questions, please feel free to, to shoot me a, an email or whatever. Um, yeah, have a good one, everyone.